hire good people because all these kids today are lazy and they don't want to work. And I thought, 1948, you're, you're hiring 20-somethings who just came back from World War II. And you're 40-something and you think they're lazy. Yeah, the world hadn't changed much. <laughs> hadn't changed much. Shall I go ahead and get started? Well, let's introduce our speaker. Okay. Professor Lee Sta uh, Snaples. Yeah. He is from TCC. How many years have you worked there? I have been at TCC since officially 1998 as a part-timer, and 2001 as a full-time professor. Mm -hmm. And this semester, I am uh, I'm a professor of history. I'll give you the background. Uh, so I have my bachelor's degree in history and uh, political science from Texas Tech University, my beloved red raiders. I have my master's degree from Texas A&M University, and I have my PhD from Texas A&M because my wonderful wife was at A&M as my girlfriend, and I figured if I didn't go there, she wouldn't marry me. So <laughs> when she was a year behind me, so I went down there, um, and I have been very happy to live up in this area. We live over in Rendon, so we're just like right around the corner from y'all. Uh, and um, I specialize in aviation history. That's what my dissertation is on, specifically naval aviation. And I had a chance on a couple of different occasions to work on fairly long projects for NASA. Um, and so I had a chance to work with the Langley uh, Research Facility uh, in uh, Langley, Virginia. Um, and then I had a chance to, uh, to spend uh, eight weeks at the Kennedy Space Center uh, out in Florida. Uh, and during that time got a chance to interview uh, launch directors, center directors, um, and engineers, so the people who fired off the rockets and sent off the, the shuttles and these sorts of things. And um, so I got asked, and I'm grateful for that, to come back and to present uh, and to talk to you a little bit about this. I've, I've gotten to give sort of this presentation a few times. I got called one time at the last minute by the Daughters of the Texas uh, Revolution, and they called me and they said, could you present? And I said, I'd be happy to talk about NASA. And they said, we usually do something a little closer to the revolution, and I said I'd be happy to talk about NASA. <laughs> How desperate are you? And uh, so I went, and they haven't invited me back, but they seem to enjoy it in time. Um, so here's the weird thing. I am coming to you tonight to talk about a federal agency that has actually been around for over 100 years. Now that's a little shocking because we tend to associate NASA with rockets and missiles and the 1950s and 60s and 70s and space race and then the shuttles in the 80s through whatever. And the easy answer is it's a little older and a little bigger than you think. So first, whoops, wrong thing. Uh, it is a little bigger than you think. We tend to think of the Kennedy Space Center. We tend to think of uh, the Johnson Space Center out in Florida. Um, but actually, it has a number of areas. So there's Goddard Space Center out in Maryland, Kennedy, as we talked about, but also the Jet Propulsion Lab of Satori. Uh, Edwards Air Force Base used to be Dryden, uh, and the Dryden Center, Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, and please note, if you ever do get down to Kennedy and you meet some of those nice people, there is one question you ask, Auburn or Alabama? Yeah. Um, because like half of them are Auburn and the other half are Alabama, and they have disparaging remarks about each one of those. Um, out at the John Glenn's Research Center in Ohio, uh, Ames is another research center, Langley, that's where I did some of my work, we're probably familiar with the Johnson. Uh, there is the Stennis Space Center where they actually assemble a lot of the rockets, that's in Mississippi. So it's in a lot of places. Now I told you it was old, right? And you say, how old? How about 1915? Well, the United States has kind of a weird history with aviation. So we invented airplanes, right? And we invented those basically in 1903, sort of. So Langley, Virginia is actually named after Samuel Pierpont Langley. Um, Samuel Pierpont Langley was a, uh, a Smithsonian official. In 1903, in that summer, he was considered basically the leading expert on aviation in the entire United States. Even the Wright brothers consulted him, and they said if we hadn't asked him questions, we'd have flown three or four years sooner. 
because everything he told us was wrong. And we had to figure out eventually that the leading expert was wrong. All right? Didn't know what he was talking about. And basically at Thanksgiving, he tried to fly and failed miserably. And then the Wright brothers flew. And people didn't believe them. And so actually the Wright brothers moved a lot of their flight over to Europe. And they flew extensively in Europe. Um, and we get some weird anomalies here. We tend to think of World War I as the first war in which we use airplanes. Actually, that's not true. Do you want to know what the first war in which we used airplanes was? The Mexican Revolution. So in 1912, a nice guy took an airplane down to Mexico, um, and he was a mercenary. And they said, can you fly over and look and see what's in the city? And he said, yes. And they said, is there any way you could drop a couple of grenades on the way? And he said, yes. <laughs> but when World War I took place, aviation exploded in its importance. And the United States realized it had a real problem. Europeans were beginning to build airplanes by the hundreds, if not thousands. In 1914, ladies and gentlemen, the United States produced 50 airplanes total. Nationwide, boom. No American company produced more than 20. So this was almost mom and pop, garage, build one, fly it, see if it worked, try for the next one. And we were way, way behind. And the military began to say, we got problems. And they went to Congress and they said, our experts, our observers are coming back, and those guys over there are using airplanes that are literally a generation ahead of us. And we invented aviation. They, in just the last year, because they have no choice, they've got to get better, they're using these things in war, are flying past us, and we got to catch up. And our aviation industry is small. It's not really developed yet. And they can't afford to even try to catch up. So Congress created the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Amazingly enough, this is almost never referred to as NACA, which would be seen. This is the NACA, all right? This is the NACA. And they did things like they built wind tunnels. Why? Because if you're a small, basically mom and pop aviation company, you can't afford to sink money, time, and effort into building a wind tunnel and test it. And they said, it's amazing. All these guys building planes, none of them have degrees. They're not engineers. They don't understand physics. They don't understand mathematics very well. This is kind of really trial and error. Okay? Lockheed, right out here in Fort Worth, was founded by the Lockheed brothers. They built one plane. Flew it across the country. Took them almost a year to fly it all the way across the country because it crashed. They would have to rebuild it wherever they happened to be and make some money, and then they'd fill it up with gas and they'd take it off again. It took a while. What well, didn't go real well. And then they got bought out by somebody who said, I know more about aviation than you do, or I have more money, or something like that. So they created the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, and they said, we need you to do the basic scientific testing to explain aeronautics. Figure out how the air works. Figure out how physics works. And that's exactly what they did. They began to develop just basic designs of, this is what a wing does. My father-in-law, big aviation fan, he is a, a, a home-built guy, flies his own planes and things like that. Well, until the last crash, but that's not really sure. Um, so when we go down there, one of the things he always wants to show me is the latest YouTube video he found. And one of the videos he finds is on a guy who set a world record building his own plane for speed, blah, blah, blah. And they asked him, where did you get the ideas? And the first thing he broke out was a book just like this prepared in the 1920s by the NACA because the physics has not changed. <laughs> 2 plus 2 is still equals 4. The air is still the air. The wing designs are still the wing designs. So today, if you wanted to build your own airplane, this is where you start. And the NACA basically explained to you, if you build a wing that looks like this, this is what it does. If you build a cross section that looks like this, this is what it does, et cetera, et cetera. And throughout the 1920s, 
it not only developed this information, which was very basic, groundbreaking stuff, wasn't ever going to make any money off of it. But if you want to move beyond the basics, we got to have this. And they developed this sort of stuff, and they said, we will find out how airplanes work. And they provided that free of charge to every company in the United States. Here you go, here's the scientific information. And those companies proceeded to build the aircraft that helped us win World War II. All right? And without that information, we're still way behind. We're still way behind. We've got to have that scientific background. Now, interestingly enough, after, after World War II, they kept doing a really good job because of let's go back, these things, these wind tunnels. So in the 1940s, aviation began to explode. We began to develop airplanes that didn't just drop bombs, but flew people all over the place. We began to run into problems with them. One of the advanced airplanes for the time was the Lockheed Constellation. And they were wonderful, beautiful airplanes until they started falling apart in midair. And nobody could figure out why. So they went to the Langley Test Facility, took their, their cross sections and their models and started testing and found several problems which were causing them to fall apart, created what is called flutter. Flutter is basically when the wing starts vibrating, their tail surface starts vibrating, and it can't stop. And it's just going to sit there and vibrate until it comes apart, and that's all there is to it. So they put them in these wind tunnels, and they began testing, and they found a solution. And that Lockheed uh, Constellation eventually became the basis of the Lockheed P-3 Orion that we used as a submarine hunter all the way into the early 2000s. Now, without NASA, all those airplanes go away. Now, here's the interesting thing. How does NASA still help us today? I'll get to this a little later, but I'm going to mention it here too. Every airplane that flies in the United States still can be tested here at NASA. Maybe three years or four years before you can get your wind tunnel time, but you do that, and you do that for free. Now, that may seem a little strange. Why is the government trying to make money off of this? Well, every time I get on a plane, and it lands safely. I thank the crew, I thank the man above, and I thank NASA for testing the plane. And I never say, how could they waste my money making sure this plane's safe? My attitude is simple. If you want to test it again, let's test it again. Let's make sure before I get on this stupid plane, it's going to land safely. Thank you very much. And that's what they do. And they contribute to basically every plane that flies in the United States, all those commercial airplanes, et cetera, et cetera, they all get tested by NASA. Now, honestly, today, they use a lot of computer simulations and they can do a lot of testing, but when they've got a problem, they still go right back to NASA. They still go back to right back to NASA and they test them. And I will tell you, when I was at the Langley facility, one of the fun things there, quite frankly, was they had the, um, the video of when the models come apart. That's not what they're shooting for. It's not normally what they want. But occasionally there are problems, and those are some fun videos to watch this thing fly apart and go flying down the tunnel. Oh, wow. And they can have them shut down in less than two seconds, and they've already lost the model. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's kind of interesting. So the NACA was doing great. It had been operating for about 40 years, honestly, and we ran into a problem. So at the end of World War II, the world, as some of you may know, was kind of divided up into two areas. One of those was the United States and the Western world, and the other was the Soviet Union and the Communist bloc, right? So Soviet Russia, Communist China, um, the Eastern Europe, some other areas. And we were in what we considered a Cold War. Now, we said, well, this is not a problem. We're smarter than they are. They are backwards. They steal our technology to try to catch up. We are so far ahead of them, this isn't even close. They're no danger because they're also a long way away. And then in late 1957, they put the first man-made object into space. This was Sputnik. Only stayed up a couple of days, but it went zooming across the sky. You could actually see it at night as it went whizzing over. And we got really worried. Because if you could put that up into space, you could drop it down on us. In fact, believe it or not, Sputnik became a curse word. So there's an old wrestler. It's called Sputnik Monroe. It's 
Sputnik Monroe operated out of uh, Tennessee in that area. He was a bad guy heel, and he got that name because one night one old lady got so mad at him, she'd run out of every name she could call him. So finally she just looked at him and said, you're a Sputnik. That's what you are, you're a Sputnik. And he went, okay, I'm a Sputnik. Because that was the most evil, nasty thing she could think of to call somebody. You're a threat to us. You're a bad, evil thing we don't want. And then the Russians did it even worse. They put the first man into space, Yuri Gagarin. And the United States government said, oh my gosh, we have to catch up. This is unacceptable. So they took the NACA and they said, you have to have a new name and you're moving up. <laughs> And we're going to call you NASA, National Air and Space Administration. And they said, you have to find people who know how to catch up. And we, they said, we know some guys. So here's the deal. Um, at the end of World War II, the country with the most advanced missiles in the entire world was Nazi Germany. Those were the V-2 rockets. Um, in fact, some of you probably remember the Scud missiles that were used in the first Gulf War. They were basically V-2s, same basic design, not, not fundamentally all that different. When Germany invented the V-2s, they were light years ahead of what anybody else in the world could do. At the end of World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union both tried to grab as many V-2s as they could. And they tried to grab as many people who knew how to work on them and make them and design them as they could as well. And interestingly enough, some of those scientists ran as far west as they could to get away from the Soviets and went, hi, I love America, please take me with you, because <laughs> I don't want to go to Russia. <laughs> it doesn't look good. So we went looking for Dr. Werner von Braun. And this is Dr. Werner von Braun here, and this is Dr. Werner von Braun in the old days. And with Dr. Werner von Braun, it's kind of obvious from the name, right? Mm -hmm. So he had been a German scientist. His previous elite officers and, and uh, bosses had been Nazis in Germany. And we kind of said, right or wrong, we don't care about that anymore because we need you. It's not quite as obvious, but when we created the Kennedy Space Center, the first director of the Kennedy Space Center was Dr. Kurt Diebus. He had been Werner von Braun's right-hand man in Germany. He had also worked for Adolf Hitler. He had also received all these commendations for trying to kill people we were defending, et cetera, et cetera. And when the war ended, we kind of forgot about that because we needed it. So this leads to one of those interesting discussions of whether the United States eventually put a man on the moon or the Germans did. Because Dr. Werner von Braun is going to be your director of NASA, and Dr. Kurt Diebus is going to be your first director of the Kennedy Space Center. So the people who really kind of oversaw it at both levels were former Nazis. Well, Germans, let's put it that way. Yeah, they got over here and promptly swore down. They had no idea who not what a Nazi even was, and that's, that's okay. That's yeah. the way it worked. It just kind of went that way. We had to tap into their know-how because in terms of the engineering and in terms of the missiles, it was actually light years ahead of what we were doing. And so we began to develop space programs. Now, here's some local tie-in. Let me go back right here. Um, so when they brought all these missiles over, um, they put a bunch of them out in White Sands, New Mexico. Okay. And when they begin to look at where should we set up to launch missiles from and launch the space missions from, one of the positions that they suggested was close to my hometown. So they suggested using down around Brownsville, Texas. I'm out of Harlingen. Um, and that's the nice place where SpaceX is using them from right now. That had already been projected back in the 1950s as a potential, except there was a problem. See these wonderful things? We were launching them out in New Mexico, and one of them got away. And it didn't go up like we wanted. It went the wrong way and went south and smashed right into a Mexican village. 
well, not quite a village. It hit the graveyard right next to the village and left this huge hole. And Mexico promptly said, no more of that. <laughs> so when we said to them, can we launch out of Brownsville over Mexico, they said, eh, no. We <laughs> see what you crazy people are doing. No. So we had to send that to Florida. Yeah, we had to send it out to Florida because Mexico wouldn't launch, let us launch over our, their territory because we'd already blown up a graveyard. <laughs> Not sure I'd blame them. It just kind of looked like a scary thing. Um, we moved out to what was at the time Cape Canaveral. Um, and it's a little confusing, but if you go out there now, there is still Cape Canaveral, and then there is the Kennedy Space Center. And they are two actually separate, different facilities. Um, Cape Canaveral is still an Air Force installation by and large, and Kennedy Space Center is a civilian or a, a, a installation. Um, and out of Cape Canaveral, we launched first the Project Mercury, and then Project Gemini. Uh, and Mercury was just simply, can we get into space? Uh, and so we will put up Alan Shepard as our first suborbital, uh, and that means he didn't actually leave Earth orbit, he just got really close. And then, of course, John Glenn is our first astronaut ever to go into space. Another quick bit of trivia here for you, which is interesting. Um, any of you know who Ted Williams is? Baseball player. Baseball player out of Boston, right? This blended splinter. Um, that was John Glenn's wingman. So Ted Williams actually flew as John Glenn's wingman in Korea. Uh, and uh, John Glenn's wife described him as the best pilot she'd ever met and the most profane man she'd ever met. <laughs> So apparently he had quite a vocabulary, but he was, believe it or not, a marine fighter pilot, John Glenn, a fighter pilot as well. And so there's some strange tie-in there, right? We then move on to Project Gemini, uh, which was basically, we understood we couldn't put just one guy up to go to the moon. We had to put two. And why were we going to the moon? Well... The Russians had already beat us into space and beat us to put the first guy on the moon. So, in 1962, in a speech down at Rice University, John F. Kennedy said, we're going to beat them to the moon. That's the real goal. And more than that, he said, we're going to beat them there by the end of this decade. Eight years from now, we will have landed on the moon. That's all there is to be able to do it. We fund the Project Mercury, fund uh, Project Gemini. And during Project Gemini, well, really sort of at the end of Mercury there, NASA got the best gift it could have gotten. And this is going to sound cool. So let me explain before you get mad at me. John F. Kennedy was killed in Dallas, Texas on November 22nd, 1963. Now, why was that good for NASA? Because the bills had started coming in. And the problem was that this whole... Project Gemini and Mercury and, and etc. were very hideously expensive. And the Kennedy administration was beginning to realize what it had promised. And it was beginning to figure out how can we get out of that promise. And then Kennedy was killed. John F. John, John F. Kennedy, sorry. Lyndon Baines Johnson became President of the United States. A couple of things here. One, Lyndon Baines Johnson was actually more committed to space than John F. Kennedy. We have a Johnson Space Center for a reason. That's because of LBJ. Uh, Houston was taken off the list like four times, and every time LBJ said, no, it goes back on the list. And second, it gave LBJ magic words. The president, meaning Kennedy, promised. And what did Congress say when he brought them another bill? The president promised we would pay. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. Here's some more money, and here's some more money, and here's some more money. And so, if you talk to some of the old timers at NASA, they don't want it published, but they're kind of convinced that if Kennedy hadn't died, we might not have made the moon because Politically, that was a very difficult bill to pay. It was just a lot of money. And if you think about how much money we spent for what really kind of little we got immediately, yeah, that's a really expensive vacation. 
um, for very few people. They did manage to put these guys up. They had to build the whole infrastructure. This is part of the problem. Um, they had to create launch pads and et cetera, and then they had to create the Kennedy Space Center. They had to create a complete brand new facility to carry out the Apollo missions. Um, it is hard to understand today how much the country was behind Apollo. When they opened up the Johnson Space Center in Houston, the city of Houston did an excellent job. They did really well. Um, they took a, a mall that was not yet opened and they converted it into a welcome center for the NASA employees. They had real estate agents there. They had school districts there to help you register your kids. Um, there was a Chevy dealer. And if you became one of the uh, Apollo astronauts, you got a brand new gold Corvette because you are, you are our best of our best. Um, and people knew those astronauts better than we know our football players or our baseball players or any of those guys. They were, they were heroes. Um, they were also kind of larger than life in more ways than one. Um, so Kennedy has a lot of stories. These guys actually, many of them liked uh, dirt track racing and things like that. Um, and uh, they were into dangerous things because that was their, their nature. They were test pilots. They were combat pilots. They didn't mind risking their life. Um, and that was what they understood they were going to have to to do. Um, they understand this was difficult stuff. Um, and yet they were also extremely, extremely good at what they did. Um, they understood those, those uh, craft as well as the scientists who had invented them. Um, and after the Apollo 1 fire, they largely <coughs> helped build this thing back, back from scratch because they understood how it was going to go. Um, I can tell you they are, you've heard of people who have just nerves of steel. So when they launched, they had uh, sensors basically everywhere on their body. Uh, and uh, on one of the failed launches, uh, when the rocket does not ignite, and it is now basically a big bomb, uh, the commander of that flight, his heart rate goes up like two beats a minute. And about 45 seconds later, he says, so are we going to launch or are you going to get us out of here? We're getting bored. He's setting out a bomb. Everybody down below is freaking out. They're like, oh my gosh, it might explode any moment. He's like, hey, go or no go, come on. Got a date tonight if I don't have to go up, all right? Help me out here. Uh, and that's just, that's just the way they were. Um, we launched a total of 17 missions. Apollo 11, of course, with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and the guy we always forget, Michael Collins, who stayed up in the command craft and didn't get to go down on the moon. Um, they do what no other human being had ever done in all of human history before, right? They land on the moon. Uh, it was kind of interesting. I had a conversation with one of the NASA employees up in Washington, D.C. Oh, about 2000 or four, and I said, how are things at, at headquarters? And he said, well, it's better, Buzz Aldrin, uh, they've instituted a new security system, and Buzz doesn't have a pass yet. And I said, what does that mean? He said, oh, he just comes up and hangs out in our offices and standing in my way, I'll talk to Buzz Aldrin all day long, you know? He's walked on the moon. Like, oh, the same stories over and over again. Hey, this is not your old grandfather who's just telling you his same old stories. This is a guy who's walked on the moon. <laughs> not all of those were successful. We are familiar with Apollo 13. In the end, there were six moon missions. Twelve human beings have walked on the moon. Now, some things to know. Sometimes it's good to be elected president at the right time. Richard Nixon was elected president in 1968. 
and in 1969, the moon missions land, and who's the only person ever to put people on the moon as the leader of a country? Richard Nixon. Did he really do this? No, but if you're there at the right time, you get credit. So who got to welcome every one of the moon missions back? Richard Nixon. Here's the weird thing. If you go out to the Kennedy Space Center today, they have a beautiful, beautiful visitor center and museum, and they have an Apollo rocket laying on its side, um, and let me, uh, well, Saturn V. Um, let me be, be clear about this. If you get a chance, those things are absolutely huge. You are amazed. They are 300 feet long. They're a football field long, and that doesn't even do them justice when you're standing there looking at these huge rockets. They are absolutely huge. Do I have a picture? No. Okay. Um, and so I had a chance to interview some of the people uh, at uh, NASA, and I said to one of the, oh, I said to one of the astronauts uh, who had been part of the Apollo missions, I said, "So what do you think of the new visitor center?" And he said, "I've been there once. I can't." He said, I hate that, that rocket. Okay. He said, that was mine. The only reason they have that rocket is because my mission got screwed. Eight years of my life working, trying to get ready for my one chance to walk on the moon. Yeah. And they canceled it. Okay. I understand. Why did they cancel it? Remember when we talked about those bills? It's really easy to pay that bill when we got to get to the moon, when we got to get to the moon, when we, we, we got to go to the moon again. No, we don't. Right? First time you take the grandkids to Disney. Okay, whatever they need. Make the experience. Second, third, fourth. Nope. Somewhere in there you say, been to Disney enough. Went last year, ain't paying for it again. So NASA went through almost a decade of now what? Now what? And so the response to that was the Space Shuttle Program, or officially what is the STS, the uh, Space Transportation System. And the idea of the Space Shuttle was that you would create a reusable vehicle, all right, that would allow you to go up and come back down and go up and come back down because all of the Apollos and all the Saturns and all the Geminis were one-way shots. You shot off those Saturn Vs, you, you burn through millions of dollars of equipment and it was gone. Congrats. So NASA had this idea that you kind of see in, in uh, um, uh, Space Odyssey 2001, where we're just going to have like airliners that just go up and come down and go up and come down. And so they're going to do that. Uh, and they developed the space shuttles. And then they found out it's not that easy. So originally space shuttles were supposed to be able to fly once per month. And we'd have to, we'd go through six or eight launches before we had to rebuild the engine. And then they started putting them up there and they remembered something they probably had forgot or didn't want to have to admit, which is that the harshest environment we can find anywhere is space. And it beats things up. And it is extremely extremely dangerous. And so instead of being able to launch once a month with a fleet of four to six space shuttles, we were lucky to be able to launch every two or three months with a fleet of four to six. And if we got two launches in a year out of one of them, we were doing pretty good because when you came down, you had to take them all apart, check every piece, put them all back together. And it takes a long time. And that's all there is to it. Now, was it effective? Well, we delivered three and a half million pounds of cargo to space. Now, we have a landfill out here that probably is approaching that. But you don't want to understand how much it costs and how difficult it is just to deliver something into space. Um, any of y'all gotten to see a rocket shot of any kind? Okay, the first thing that freaks you out is it doesn't go, it goes. It's taking a long time. <laughs> is it okay? And they're like, yeah, it, it, it takes a while. They don't just zoom. This is not this is not your firecrackers at home. This is not a bottle rocket. That's not the way it works. Um, they developed the space uh, Hubble space that telescope. 
uh, the ISS, they launched off various probes um, and they went up and they brought stuff back. For instance, once they launched Hubble, if you might remember, had a small problem. The lens didn't work right. So they had to take up a new lens and put it over the old lens to make it work. If we don't have the space shuttles, then that doesn't work. Now, here's part of the quandary. NASA wanted us to believe that the space shuttles were as safe as Southwest Airlines. Okay, how many of y'all keep those Southwest uh, Airline Pilot trading cards? Remember when we talked about those guys back in the Apollo mission that everybody knew their name, etc.? NASA's quandary here is we don't pay attention when something's supposed to be safe. We only pay attention when it's supposed to be dangerous and incredible and amazing. And NASA needed the support, but it didn't want the attention. And that puts you in a quandary, because if you need the support, then you need the attention. And so they went through and they put up their, their space shuttles, and they got amazing pictures. And you might remember they began to take up all sorts of people, including John Lynn again, who was in his 80s at the time, but they took him back up and gave him another ride in space. Must be nice. And they uh, flew those shuttles back and forth. Um, did it all go well? Well, sort of, but not really. Um, so they have tremendous successes. We went to the moon. Now, let's be clear. Last moon mission was 1971, 1972. What, what year is this again? 2024. 2024. Okay. In 2001, when I was at the Kennedy Space Center, China had announced it was going to the moon. That was uh, 23 years ago. Still waiting. Now India's announced we're going to go, or Russia's announced we're going to go, and still ain't seen this. So we are 50 years beyond the moon missions. We haven't been back. The Russians haven't been there. Chinese haven't been there. Europeans haven't been there. Indians haven't been there. Nobody's been there except us using now what is 50, 60 year old technology, all right? Um, we have explored amazing portions of this galaxy. You wanna have fun, you wanna look at some cool pictures, go on to the NASA websites and take a look at some of the pictures they have and they are absolutely gorgeous, they are absolutely beautiful. The shots of amazing, the shots that we get of what's out there are absolutely amazing. We have had some tremendous successes so we dropped the Mars rovers down on, uh, and I don't think Curiosity is still up there, but we dropped the R, uh, Mars rovers down there for what were supposed to be six month missions running around Mars. And, uh, you know, the first one made seven years, second one made 14, and they just kept running around. And we said, oh my gosh, that's pretty cool. Have we had some problems? Yes. One of the things that still really bothers the people or did the ones who were alive was the Apollo 1 fire. Um, so in case you're not familiar with that, Apollo 1 uh, was setting on the pad for a test uh, and it was working off basically a heavy, rich, rich oxygen environment and there was a spark, there was a problem with an electrical system and it sparked and it was over. Um, and, uh, uh, Grissom, Chaffee, and White were killed probably in a matter of <clears throat> just a minute or two. Uh, actually, probably the most likely thing is it burned up enough of the oxygen in the, in the space capsule and it charred them and it wasn't, wasn't real pretty. And I had a chance to, when I was at NASA, get a, uh, a tour from one of the engineers and I had asked him how well did you know? And he said, my job was to tape sensors to their bodies. Um, and he said, we talked about anything in your <laughs> except where I was putting my hands. Um, and Because we didn't want to talk about that. And he said, so I knew everything about all three of those guys. And it was still choking him up, you know, 30 years later. It still was, or 40 years later, it was still kind of a problem. Apollo 13, uh, and that Challenger day was wrong. I'm sorry. Alliance is 98. Um, uh, Challenger was 85. 
Uh, and uh, but uh, y'all probably do remember the Challenger mission. Um, that was basically uh, it was too cold. It was that summer? It was too cold. Uh, and there was tremendous pressure because of uh, uh, Krista McCulloch, who was going to be the first teacher in space, and there was political pressure to make that look good, and they shouldn't have launched. And that's all there is to it, and it cost a lot of people their jobs, and it cost about 18 months of the STS mission. And then we get Columbia, which unfortunately broke up right over here over Texas. Um, and again, unfortunately, here's the reality. If you were going into the harshest environment in the entire world, um, in the entire universe, then some famous bad time, bad things happen. Uh, I would remind you that uh, Magellan was the first uh, leader to circumnavigate the world, only he wasn't, because he died in the Philippines. So his expedition made it all around the world, he did. It was too dangerous, and to go into space is still a very difficult and dangerous proposition, although we, we do it now fairly regularly. Uh, the Mars probe was another just dumb thing. We shot off a probe to Mars, and then we found out that uh, the Europeans were working off of the metric system, we were working off our, uh, the English system, and we put the wrong numbers in, and we just you know blew 20 or $30 million dollars with some, what the heck. Why not? Go ahead. What does it do for us? <sighs> LEDs, infrared thermometers, artificial limbs, grooved pavement. Where the rumble strips and things like that? No, it, it, it did that. Water purification. They had to find all sorts of things to work. Your laptops, all that, none of that exists without NASA because they were pumping money into the idea of, I don't need a computer that fills this room. I gotta get it smaller, I've gotta get it this, I've gotta get it that, I've gotta get it, I've gotta get it, I've gotta get it. Um, if you go out to your car tonight and you uh, plug in uh, uh, an address on your phone, yes, yeah, so thank you for taking us and making it so we don't have to ask directions, you know? Um, you talk to all those, all, look at all those things, NASA does those things for us. Um, here's the problem. Where do we go now? And this is a solution that I haven't found in 20 years since I was out of NASA. In 2001, they were trying to figure out where to go now. Because their attitude on the moon was simple. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. Don't need to go back. Be a waste of money. Um, can we get more space stations, so we have eight or ten of them up there instead of just one that we share with the Russians, et cetera, et cetera. Can we go to Mars? Can we go somewhere else? Well, there's kind of a problem. So Kennedy Promise doesn't work anymore. How many billions of dollars are you willing to spend? Because when you go back here, the people of the 60s never saw most of that technology. People of the 70s didn't see most of that technology. Okay, tank, they saw that, but other than that, um, you have to get all the way up to people in the 80s, 90s, and today to really understand how much of an impact all that technology made on our lives, good or bad. How much money are you willing to sink into technology that your grandchildren will enjoy 50 years from now? Kennedy promised. Well, Kennedy's not around anymore, so we don't care. What, how are they doing? Um, they are still developing safer airplanes. I tell people today, the safest, most efficient company or industry in the entire world is the airline industry. I tell my students when I talk to them, how about this? If you miss one question on one test in the next four years, you flunk. Can't do that. I so said, what if one plane crashes every four years for Delta? Delta's out of business. American Airlines is out of business. United's out of business. 
they put up thousands of flights per day. And what's their success rate? It's either 100% or they're in trouble. Boeing has had problems with three airplanes recently, three or four. They may be in real trouble because we don't put up with airplanes falling out of the sky. Um, climate change, weather study, all that sort of stuff. Got to figure it out. NASA is going to help us with that. Medical advancements. The stuff they are doing now, much of that has been driven by what NASA has pushed in terms of technology. And we are looking at, are there things we can do and grow in space that we could bring back down and make us all better? All those things are possible when we decide this is where we want to go. Now, where do we want to go? I'm going to tell you the problem for the last 30 years for NASA, if not longer, is there's been no national consensus. We could see the moon. We could see the Russians trying to get to the moon, and by gosh, we were going to beat them, right? Mm -hmm. We don't see anybody going to Mars, and we don't look up every night and see it and say, that'd be cool. So Mars is a lot further away, a lot more expensive, and we got problems down here we'd rather spend our money on. And I, I don't disagree with that. I understand it. I got no problems with that. Um, NASA has delivered over the last, well, NASA and the NACA, let's not forget those nice people, have delivered for over 100 years scientific advancements which have helped this country tremendously. We have spent money which did not pay off for years and years, but it eventually paid in, in droves. When we look today and we say, well, a space program cost us, say, five to eight billion dollars. You know what a B-2 bomber cost? They're like two billion dollars a piece. So four B-2 bombers and we go to the moon. Well, that's not quite the way they looked at it, <laughs> right? But the first new car you bought, you thought that was expensive, right? And what do your kids today say? Gosh, that was cheap. You bought one for what? <laughs> so, at some point, maybe we decide, you know, if we spend $50 billion on NASA, our grandchildren will think we, we didn't spend that much. Any questions? This is the interactive portion. Go for it. I uh, believe would you talk a little bit about uh, association with NASA and SpaceX? Um, so, one of the weird things here that has happened, um, and it is not new. So, during the heyday of the Apollo mission, um, about 12,000 people lived uh, and worked out at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, and when I say lived and worked, it was kind of interesting. Um, because uh, for the 1960s, the county with the highest divorce rate in the United States was Broward County. Uh, in, uh, in Florida. Uh, and that's because many of the engineers working on these projects would literally stay out there for weeks in their offices working on whatever. Okay? When I got to NASA in 2001 and I got to spend eight weeks there that summer, they were down to about 2,000 NASA employees. Now they still ran eight to 10,000 people in Kennedy. All the rest of them were contractors. So they had turned much of that work from government employees, who are people who are going to get a pension, who are people who are going to have jobs and you have to find a reason to fire them and all that, over to a contractor and said, when the contract's up, goodbye, have a nice day. Um, I had a chance to spot, speak to the uh, archivist because that's what I was out there doing. And the uh, contract for the archive was up and I said, what does that mean for you? And she said, nothing, it just means somebody else will pay me. So they turned a lot of that stuff over to um, private industry with the idea that private industry would eventually be able to do it cheaper and be able to do it faster and be able to do it more efficiently, in large part because they didn't have to do all the initial research. And so any new product I'm developing, there is my research and development cost, and that's my big upfront. And my, my fear there is I'm going to sink a bunch of money and then it's not going to work. 
So what you are looking at down at SpaceX in Okachika um, is that they are basically working off what NASA developed. Uh, and actually, if you look at their rockets, they're not that fundamentally different than what were being used for the Apollo program. Um, I can tell you, if you have not had a chance to go down there, um, I, I go down there and visit the family occasionally, or, yeah. Um, and so I've been out there to the SpaceX area about three times. Uh, and I am A, shocked, because they let you ride up on SpaceX and you can see the rocket maybe 150 feet over there, or 100, 100 feet over there. And I'm like, Kennedy, a mile out, they stop you. They're like, nope, close enough. Um, and so they let you really close. Um, and they are hoping that um, they will be able to do that faster, cheaper, et cetera. Now, part of that is also some political consideration. Um, and that political consideration is that if I build the Kennedy Space Center, I'm writing a check for years. Because when I hire all those people and I build those facilities, I have to maintain them, I have to keep paying those people, and I am making literally a 20 or 25 year commitment. And if I employ this lovely lady here for 25 years, then I'm probably going to end up paying for her retirement and all that sort of stuff. If they can turn that over to SpaceX, then they write a check each year. And it's more like me paying Federal Express to take my package somewhere. And it's their problem. Will that ultimately be successful? I don't know. Because in the case of SpaceX, um, they're a business. So they're going to focus on what is profitable. Is Mars profitable? Only if the U.S. hands a big, a big enough check to make it profitable. Um, and at some point, they need to make a profit off of that, too. Now, the hope is, again, without having to sink all the money in infrastructure, it will eventually be cheaper. Will that work out? I, I, um, but uh, I can tell you, they are still using the same um, experts, and they're going back and Dwight D. Eisenhower warned us to be wary of the military industrial complex. Maybe we may stop working about the space industrial complex where people go from NASA right into SpaceX and there's some conflict of interest there. I don't know, eventually. Right now, in real terms, I would tell you as a percentage of budget, we're still spending such a small amount. It's Do I hope they're successful? Yes. Are there are there a few fans who really are excited about what they're doing? Yes. Is it enough of Americans to make that big a difference? Uh, in fact, I, I would, and I'm not making a political statement, but if you watch the upcoming presidential election and count how many times either candidate talks about space, yeah. it is not going to make an appearance in the campaign. If it gets a casual mention, I'll be kind of surprised, but none of them is going to say, elect me and we will go to Mars. Because <laughs> nobody in the audience is going to care. And I, that, I'm not trying to sound negative. It's, it it just, just not inspired us the way that really our parents were inspired by the idea of we've got to get to the moon. Mm -hmm. um, so well, we just, I think it's because we had an enemy. Yeah, we had, in, we had somebody who were racing. And in this situation, we don't. Yeah. And, and again, when I was at Kennedy and the Chinese were talking about they were going to the moon, NASA didn't care. Right. They're like, it's, it's a dead rock. Go, go visit it. It's a waste of money. Yeah. yeah. I mean, nice pictures. Yeah. Like Rome or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, that's a horrible thing to say, but that's, that's what it was. And if we had, not, now, all the technologies we got out of the moon mission, make it worth it? Could we have developed those without it? Probably. Would we? Would we have thought of them? We wouldn't, we wouldn't have had a need. Right. It's always the need that drives those inventions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the reason aviation increases dramatically in World War One and World War Two is we have a need. Right. So we're going to invent better airplanes, and if it costs money, by gosh, spend it, feel free. Right. Yeah. Anything else I can answer for you? Or I can try to answer? Yeah. Well, Lee, I've really enjoyed this. Well, thank you. My pleasure. And uh, I heard President Kennedy's last speech when he spoke in Fort Worth. 
but that he was a self sensitive. I would add a lesson to him. I, I think that is, unfortunately, I was not around then. Um, I do remember, I mean, my first kind of vivid memory is the Challenger explosion and it going up. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it was a tremendous era. Um, and in real terms, when you talk about who did that, you are still talking about the young men who fought in, in, in women, because there were plenty of them working at NASA at the time, um, who had been part of that World War II generation, that generation who had fought World War II uh, and then had carried over into the 50s and 60s. So when you think about it, that's the people who are in their late 40s, early 50s at the time. Uh, and so that's really who we were talking about. Yeah. And some of the stories they would tell was, were wonderful. Um, we were out with uh, a, a NASA official who shall remain nameless. And he was mentioning that um, during the Apollo missions, uh, each NASA astronaut had another astro astronaut assigned to their families to go and tell you if something went wrong. And he said, Gus Grissom had three. He had one for his wife, one from his, for his mistress in Florida, and one for his mistress in Houston. Um, so Gus had arranged that if something went wrong, his two girlfriends would find out just like the wife did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he also was telling, and then I'll shut up because I didn't know. Yeah. He was telling, he said they were young engineers, and here comes three NASA Apollo astronauts who shall remain nameless. And they had gotten into a drinking bet at a bar about which one of them would fit in the command module of the largest woman on top of them. So they had brought three ladies from the bar, and the NASA engineer head said, you can't, that's a multi-million dollar. And they basically said, get out of our way or we hurt you because we're the astronauts. <laughs> and they're not going to fire us, they're going to fire you if something goes wrong, so move. <laughs> and I said, what happened? He said, my boss moved. <laughs> and he said, they all got in. And they all fit, and they all came out arguing about who won, um, and they went on. And he said that was just, they were that kind of people who would do that and then the next morning be back going through mathematical con calculations and finding mistakes. They were just absolutely stunning and amazing people. Um, and so when you look at them, um, it was an impressive group, and I'm not sure we can duplicate them. I'm not sure we can really want to because they were difficult to control, <laughs> but there they were. That's a fighter pilot mentality that's really detailed in the right stuff if you read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, they, and they were, and they were all test pilots, and right. they were all, um, I tell you, if you want to uh, study uh, a really great one, uh, uh, Stony Musgrove uh, is a uh, story Musgrove, my apologies. Uh, if you find a little bit of his history, um, I was always stunned by a story. Um, don't quote me on the years, but he got his bachelor's in like 50, and then his mas first master's in 51, and his second master's in 52, and his MD in 54, and his PhD in 56. And, and I'm looking at this going, how? How? And it wasn't even at the same school. He was going here and here and here. And he'd go there in a year and get a master's degree. And then go on. And um, last time I had looked, he was up to something like 50 or 60,000 flight hours. Um, and I had been cataloging some of the NASA astronauts and how long they had been flying. And, you know, eight to 10,000 hours was usually pretty impressive. And if they got to 20, and with him, it was like 40,000 hours or something in jets alone. And then he had his own A definite planes. overachiever. Yes. Oh, just. And then in the 80s, went back and got his master's in art appreciation or art history or something. Cause, to get what he missed. Yes, to get what he missed. And that's that was the kind of mentality. Now, he was a shuttle pilot. Mm. Um, but you still saw those just really amazing individuals coming along. Um, at some point, they'll probably start moving more towards drones. And we won't risk the lives, but we'll, we'll see. Because at some point, we, we want to go see it because it's cool. All right. Well, thank you all for coming out.
Thank I thank you, you very much for the invitation yeah. again. Thank that you was very for good. coming. Very good. We really enjoyed it. We never know about our turnout. <laughs> okay. But everyone that was here was blessed by it, and the other ones missed out. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I felt like I relived my whole, <laughs> yeah. you know, remembering all those events mm -hmm. and stuff. And yeah. I was in Chicago when the astronaut parade came through with uh, the moon, um, you know, Buzz Aldrin and those guys. Okay. And um, so I have memories everywhere along the way that you, just, other than not, you know, not the NACO. Yes, the no I, mean, I don't remember that. But. Well, that is, to me, the, the kind of fascinating history everybody forgets. We think that NASA was created in the 50s, but no, there had been a whole 40-year history yeah. where they had actually accomplished, because when you go back to those cross-sections, those really are still the basic Bible mm -hmm. of airplane building. You start with the NASA, <coughs> the NACA cross-sections, because all that math is still still solid. Um, and you, well, they still teach that in uh, yeah. flight schools. In flight school, aeronautics, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, and when you look at the wind tunnel tests and, and some of the wind tunnels there, uh, the transonic dynamics tunnel and some of the others out at NASA Langley, those were built in the 30s and 40s, sometimes into the 50s. Um, and so we are still using them mm -hmm. 70, 80 years later. We're using the same tunnel. Um, like you say, the physics doesn't change. Physics doesn't yeah. change. And now they've upgraded, they've added this and that, and, but the basic tunnel design, I need a tunnel. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I, 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 basic shape design hasn't changed. Um, and eventually they will shift a lot of that to computers, but you don't have the computer data until you do the, the hard stuff. Right. Uh, I'll tell you one last story, uh, and that is I had a, a chance to interview the uh, the general who took over, uh, the Air Force general who took over after uh, Challenger crashed. And um, so he told about going out on this big listening tour around. He went to every building on the Kennedy uh, Space Center, which they have over 150 individual buildings out there. And if you've never had the chance to go out and do that tour, um, let me suggest you do that. Um, because if you've never stood by the Vehicle Assembly Building, uh, the VAB is 400 feet tall, um, and it is huge. That is where they used to assemble those big things. Um, and if you think these space shuttles looked big, no, they are only about 200 feet tall. And so the vehicle assembly building, uh, those were massive. And then the crawlers, where they, they moved them from the VAB eight miles out to the pad, um, and it took them about 10 hours because the crawler has a top speed of about a mile and a half per hour, uh, and that's it, because if you talk about the amount of weight they're carrying and all this for the launch pad, it's, it's stacked. And he told, he said, I went to all these different places, and I was talking about what they needed and what they, et cetera, and so I get to one of these facilities, and I said, you know, can I help you in there? Can, what can I do for you? And so they're kind of looking at each other, like, you don't want to say this. He said, no, no, come on, tell me. They said, okay, well, out there, we pull our cars up. And there's an overhang and the pigeons sit there. <laughs> and he said, I'm sitting here thinking, that's what's bothering you? And he said, well, what if we got some chicken wire? And he said, yeah, would you approve that? Yes, $20, chicken wire, go ahead. You know? <laughs> and so they delivered $20, you know, $20, a roll of chicken wire out there, put it up. And he said, morale soared. <laughs> well, you don't want to go out every day and have pigeon poop all over your car. <laughs> he said, no, here we are trying to launch people into space and all this, and they ain't wanting to control the pigeons. But that's something they saw every day. <laughs> and that was it. Yeah, they were kind of fascinating people. Well, also, somebody's listening to them. If somebody's that's listening. The and it, part. it also shows yeah. you they're all just human beings. Right. And they weren't going to get to go into space. And, uh, yeah.